something you've been putting off. Maybe you say, someday I'll do that, or when I have more time. Whether the item is a big bucket list item or something smaller like going on a hike, now is the time to start your Say Yes list. And we have the perfect process to help you turn these items into reality. Join thousands of others with our free Say Yes list template at thesayyesexperience.com forward slash list. It'll help you stop living in that someday and start making those list items come true today. So download it now at thesayyesexperience.com forward slash list. Welcome to the Say Yes Experience podcast, where we inspire you to get out of your comfort zone and into possibility. Our mission at the Say Yes Experience is to empower 10 million people to say yes. If you're new here, welcome. We're thrilled you're here. I'm Jessica Rector. I co-founded the Say Yes Experience with my then nine-year-old son, Blaze, based off his idea to let's just say yes to things. I'm one of the top experts on burnout, and companies and conferences hire me to present on mental health, wellness, and burnout prevention. As the number one best-selling author of 11 books, keynote speaker, and a burnout specialist, I've seen so much with our clients. The Say Yes experience was started to help you really start living, to do the things that light you up, have more fun, and turn your dreams of what we call Say Yes list items into reality. So thank you for investing in yourself and being here. Now let's make it happen. The reigning Miss Boston is determined. Being crowned Miss Boston wasn't an easy task, but Arcadia Ewell didn't give up, and she's not giving up on what she's most passionate about either. She is a passionate advocate for ending dating and domestic violence. As a dating violence survivor, she doesn't want anyone to endure what she suffered. This episode is for everyone. Even if you're not in a violent situation, it's vital to know what to do in case someone you know is or someone that you know might find themselves in this situation in the future. Please help me welcome my guest today, Arcadia Yule. Welcome to the show, Arcadia. We're so excited you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Of course, of course. We're excited to get in it because you are currently Miss Boston, which is extremely exciting. So tell us a little bit about that journey and how that came to be. Sure. So what that means, Miss Boston, I am a local title holder within the Miss America organization. So a lot of people have heard of that before. You might have seen it on TV. Uh, But Miss America is actually what a lot of people don't realize. It's one of the nation's leading providers of scholarships for young women. So that's what attracted me at first. I had a couple of friends who were competing. I'm a first generation student. So I was like, I need some money for college. And I got involved very early in life, I was about 14 or 15, I started competing in the Miss America's Teen program and then competed for a long, long time. And eventually I actually aged out of the program. So what that means basically is there was a limit. You could only be 24 years old to compete. I turned 24 and I was done. Yeah. That guys made my way out and then they raised the age to 25. Came back one more year, aged out again, and then they raised it one more time. This past February, they raised the age to 28. So I got that phone call from a couple of my friends and they were like, the age is up. Are you going to compete again? And I said, I don't know. I need to sleep on it. And the very next day I had registered to compete for Miss Boston. And two weeks later, I was crowned. What? Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Yeah. You decided to compete. And then two weeks later was the competition and you were quick turn around that is super fast oh my gosh so what made you or what led you decide to say yes and to compete Mm -hmm. so i think initially like i said when i was a teen a lot of it was i was looking for friends i was looking for scholarship dollars but then it almost was like a second time that i really had to say yes to doing it Mm -hmm. so i competed for miss massachusetts last summer And it was the first time I ever made the top 10 semifinalists. And that has been my goal. My whole life long, I just wanted to be a top 10 semifinalist. I didn't. Last summer, I had my moment. And then I, now, thank you. And then I aged out and I felt like I had my closure. I was done. I was ready to really move on with my life. And life went on. I'm also a PhD student outside of doing all this. So I was focusing on my dissertation. I was focusing on school. Um, I was actually kind of signed up to become a volunteer within the organization and kind of 
be a mentor for other girls in the future. Like I was going yeah. and it was very unexpected when they raised that age limit. Nobody saw it coming. And I just remember that night that I got those phone calls was probably the most frantic I've ever been in my entire life because my phone is just ringing off the hook and I'm sitting almost like rocking back and forth. Like, what am I going to do? And really kind of debating whether or not that was the right choice for me. And finally, I just kind of sat myself down. I'd always wanted to be Miss Boston. That was the local title that has just been my dream. Boston's obviously capital of Massachusetts. It's this historic city. It's an amazing opportunity. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to I didn't want to look back and say I could have gone after an opportunity and I chose not to. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was it was a tight turnaround. It was a lot of work. It's been a lot of work since. It's been really hard balancing being a title holder and being a PhD student. But you only get so many opportunities in life to like seize opportunities and just yeah. soak for all they're worth. I love it. And especially because that's been a dream. It was almost impossible. I mean, very, very hard to not do it if that's been a dream of yours, but then also balancing so many things. So you only had two weeks to prep for the competition. What did you, what did those two weeks look like? It's funny, actually, when I decided to compete, I told everyone, I was like, it's in two weeks, but it's no big problem. You know, I'll just use the same talent song I did last year. I'll use the same gown I did last year. Like, I'm good. I made top 10 at States. I don't need to change anything. And as I kind of got into it, I was like, I don't want to do the same thing I did. I want to do something new. I want to be like, I'm grown up, right? Like I, yeah. I said goodbye to this program. I moved on with my life and now I'm coming back. I want to come back stronger. Mm -hmm. So in those two weeks, I actually changed my talent song. I'm a singer. So I switched from doing kind of like a pop rock type vocal where you can be kind of fun and gritty and you don't have to worry about your technique as much. And I switched to more of a musical theater where I really had to rely on like my classical training and make sure my pitches were good and make sure my rhythm was good. I switched my gown. I had to like teach myself how to walk again, which sounds so funny um, if you're not like in the pageant world. But there is a pageant walk, right? And it's not the one we do on daily life. So you kind of have to just brush brush things off and get back in that phase of life that I didn't think I was going to be in again. Wow. And you were able to do it in such a short period of time. What's your platform or what was your platform for Miss winning Miss Boston? Yeah. So uh, same thing. It hasn't changed. But initially then and still now, my community service initiative is called Learning to Love. It's about combating dating violence. So I have had that as my personal program and initiative for so many years. I'm a dating violence survivor myself. I became a stalking survivor when I was 14 years old. And the really kind of troubling part of that story, or at least one of them, mm -hmm. is that I didn't realize that was wrong at the time. I knew it made me feel uncomfortable, right? Like I feel good about the behavior, but it really wasn't until I was much older and I was an adult and I was studying psychology in school and I started getting those definitions of what dating and domestic violence actually is that the light bulbs went off and I was kind of like, okay, I've had that, I've experienced that. And now as an adult, as a title holder, and, um, you know, furthermore, as a psychologist, a psychologist in training, I am really passionate about making sure we are having some of those educational conversations because I don't think it's ever right that somebody could be dating and could be experiencing abuse and just not know it. So tell us what some of that looks like. So in case someone listening, you know, if they're going through that, they can have, oh, I didn't even know that. Yes, that's what I'm going through. Yeah. So I do this a lot as Miss Boston. I've actually started a very successful speaking campaign. I've been able to present to over 2,000 students across the Commonwealth. And one of the things that I do during those conversations is really define the forms of abuse. So what I experienced is stalking, right? That is any pattern of unwanted harassment that really incites fear or is just simply unwanted by the victim. So for me, my stalker did a lot of that behavior online. It was a lot of messaging me and my friends asking where I was, what I was doing, who I was with. There's also physical abuse. That can be actual physical harm um, or it could be threats of physical harm too. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Yeah. Uh, I'm saying I'm going to hurt you still count. That's still a problem. We have emotional abuse. 
that can be put downs, insult. That's where uh, gaslighting as a term would fall. Mm -hmm. Sexual abuse, you know, forcing you to do things, pressuring you to do things. Um, and then financial abuse is another big one too. And that would be kind of using finances and money to really exert power and control over you. And that's where everything kind of cycles back is the abuser is going to look to exert power and control over you. That is their end goal. And all of these different forms of abuse are just the tools that they're using to do that. That is crazy. Some of those I would have never, I mean, like financial abuse, I never even would have thought of that. So it's so important to get those things out. So when people are going through them, they can say, oh, that's me. I didn't even know that existed. Or, oh, wow, someone can really do that. I think I might be in that situation or my sister or my, you know, my son or, you know, someone might be in that situation. And I think oftentimes we immediately go to women that that happened, that those things happen to, but those things can happen to men as well. Have you found that to be the case? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this kind of relates back to our, our topic of saying yes is anytime I get the chance to talk about these things, I'm going to say yes, because you never know. Situations like this happen yet where you're just talking about it. And somebody's like, I didn't know that. And recently I was actually out of college. I was presenting about my story about these definitions. And a young man came up to me afterwards and then he pulled me aside and was like, I just need to talk to you for a quick minute. And I was like, yeah, of course, what's going on? And he said, you know, I've never heard of financial abuse before. I never, I did not know that was a thing. And I'm not sure if I'm experiencing that right now, but my partner doesn't have a lot of financial flexibility. And so my partner is kind of demanding that I stay with them and that I continue supporting them. Like, would that count? And we really kind of had to sit down and, and talk through that and talk through what those behaviors were and try to piece together, like, what is the motivation there? Because really, it does center around power and control. Um, that's what our science tells us. Yeah. That's what I'm telling you as a psychologist. So it does happen a lot to people of all different genders, gender identities, sexual orientations. Abuse doesn't discriminate, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and so we all need to be part of that conversation. We all need to be learning and we all need to be then taking what we've learned and telling that to others. Well, and I think a vital and important part of what you're talking about is talking about it. The more we talk about it, the less shame that is associated with it, the more people feel open to saying, okay, well, maybe that's happening to me or talking with someone about the situation. Because I would also think that there's shame involved around it. So people don't want to talk about it. People don't want to acknowledge it because they might feel dumb or stupid. Like, how can I let this person do this to me? Or how do I not know better? I should know better. I'm a smart person. And so then they just don't talk about it. And then they just stay in that situation or they're too scared to find the resources or the how to get out of it because they don't want to talk about it and admit that it's happening. And then it just keeps perpetuating the problem where they stay in that situation and then they create their stories for themselves saying, I don't know how to get out. I can't get out. And so they keep staying in situations like that and not having or knowing even where to get those resources. Sure. And I think that's especially true for teens too. And teens get overlooked a lot when we talk about this topic because our mind goes straight away to like husband and wife dynamics or mm -hmm you know, couples that are living together. But in truth, it does happen to teens. And that is that adds so many difficulties. Let's say you're dating somebody and your parents don't allow you to date. So they don't know that you're dating them. And all of a sudden you're in this abusive situation, but you don't feel comfortable telling your parents because that's mm -hmm. going to cause conflicts there. Teens don't always have the same flexibility to leave relationships because they still go to school with this person. They're still going to say that, mm -hmm. right? So if we as adults are not having those open conversations and we are not creating a space where our younger generation feels really comfortable talking about these topics, then they are going to enter the dating world. They might start experiencing these things and that's going to shape what they think relationships look like for the rest mm -hmm. of their life. Mm -hmm. That's so true and very important to have them with, with our teens. And, and I love what you said, like, they still have to go to school with those people. And then they don't want to tell their parents about it because they don't want to create conflict there. But they may not also tell their friends about it because 
What if their friend really likes this person or what if their friend is friends with that person? And then that creates conflict at school. And then it just trickles out. So where they feel like there's no safe place that they can go and share and really get that help. So where can teens go to get that help? The best place is a trusted adult. It does not have to be mom and dad. That can be anyone. For me, how my situation played out, like I said, when I was going through it, I didn't realize that any of that behavior was really wrong. This right. was my interaction romantically with someone. And so I essentially this young man had asked me to be his girlfriend and I was very flattered, but I said, no, thank you. And that's when a lot of this behavior started. So mm-hmm. my instinct is like, OK, this is how people handle rejection. And my friend actually mentioned it to my parents. So that's, first of all, for teens who might be listening, that's always an option, too. If you notice your friend is going through something, yeah, uh, it's not always easy to be the one to report that something's happening with your friends to an adult. But sometimes that can be really life-saving. Yes, necessary. Um, yeah, talking to parents, talking to guidance counselors at school, if you have sports coaches, mentors, anyone, finding an adult is really helpful. There are also a lot of resources online. Love is Respect is a website that is specifically centered around dating violence. And it's this great website. You're going to get a ton of information. You're going to learn how to safety plan. You're going to learn how to identify healthy versus unhealthy versus abusive. And they have a lot of great resources that they can kind of send things out to you. And the last one that I'll mention, actually, I serve as an ambassador for Bling Sting, which is the industry leader for like cute personal safety devices. And so that means like rhinestone or sparkly safety alarms or pepper spray, like that. Because taking taking control of your personal safety doesn't have to be a scary thing. It can be a cute keychain that you put on your backpack and you have it there. And the worst case scenario is that you never have to use it. And that's not a bad situation. Uh, the best case scenario is it gives you a little peace of mind and a little bit of safety when you're walking around. Right. So what is a safety plan? Great question. Do you want to start saying yes, but you just don't know where to start? And oftentimes when we don't know where to start, we just don't start. So we created an ebook just for you. We put together 101 ways to say yes in this ebook. Ideas, big and small, things that only take a small amount of time, like one to two minutes. Whether you're saying yes to yourself, in your family, relationships, or pushing yourself a lovingly outside of your comfort zone with adventures. It's all made to really help you become more of your rock star self. So you can get this ebook at besayyesexperience.com forward slash book, B-O-O-K. So if you want to start saying yes, or maybe you need some ideas on how to say yes, because you get so caught up in being busy and doing tasks and projects, or doing laundry and cooking that the time flies by and you want to spend time with your family but you just don't know how to say yes. Those ideas just don't come to you. We put it together to make it super, super easy for you. So go to thesayyesexperience.com forward slash book to get your copy today and start saying yes now. Are you feeling overwhelmed, stressed, or burned out? We get it, you're not alone. In fact, according to our research, 79% of the workforce is in burnout and almost half are in extreme burnout. In fact, it's the number one reason why people are leaving organizations. They're burned out. They're looking for something more. They're looking for something better. But it doesn't have to be that way. We have your solution. It's called Blaze Your Brain to Extinguish Burnout. 52 Keys to Prevent breakthrough and eliminate burnout you can find your copy at justcorrector.com forward slash store now this is a great tool that you can use with yourself with your colleagues within your organization everyone can get one and you can go through one a week with them and at the end you can say what was something that worked this week what was the success you had so you can champion and encourage each other You can also ask what were the challenges and issues that came up so you can mastermind and brainstorm around those to keep those from coming up in the future. So make sure you get your copy at justcorrector.com forward slash store.
All books are autographed with a personal message just for you. So a safety plan can be a couple different things based on context. We talk about safety plans when we talk about depression too. But for a abusive situation, a safety plan is going to be really sitting down and thinking through your options ahead of time. So that might look like if I am currently in an abusive situation, let's say my partner is physically hurting me, where are the people I can call? Where are the places I can go? If I'm trying to exit the relationship, where are places I can get money? What are the days that my partner is not home that I can move out of the house? And there are prompts for this. There are templates online that you can just sit down and it really forces you to kind of stop yeah. what your options are. Think through who is in your life that can help support you and think through what that plan is going to look like if you need to safely exit the relationship. Well, and I think just thinking about exiting a relationship when you're in a situation like that can be very overwhelming, right? You don't know what you don't know. You don't know where you can go that is going to be safe. You want to be safe. Are they going to come after me? Are they going to find me? Like, what's going to happen? So you tend to be, I would think, on high alert with everything. But the last thing you're really like focused on is creating that plan, but also creating it in a successful way. So I love that there's things out there for them to, like a template for them to go through step by step to make sure that they've worked everything out figured out all the answers to the questions that are going on in their mind. What if this happens or where can I go or how can I, all those kind of things for them to get answers. So they also feel more safe and secure leaving that situation. Well, and as an advocate in this realm, the number one question that we always get asked, why didn't she leave? Why didn't he leave? Right? It's, it's such a frustrating question to be asked because it paints this really complex moment in time as a simple just decision. And it's mm-hmm. that. especially when we're talking about people who have kids involved, having to escape with your children, that's a whole different ballgame. And what we know as scientists, what our research shows us is actually leaving the relationship is the most dangerous time. That is when we actually see the most homicides. So that is why it's so important that A, we are showing compassion to victims when they are trying to exit. B, we're providing them the resources and the supports that they need to safely exit. And then C, as a society, we're providing them with safe places to go, whether that be women's shelters, whether that be affordable housing, things like that, so that they can kind of get away from that situation and start over. That, I mean, that is just mind modeling when you're thinking about that's when like, most homicides happen is when there people are trying to get away from that place and then when you put kids involved then how are they going to adapt to it how are they going to respond especially if you know a lot of kids love that other parent love the other person in the relationship so how is it also going to be for them to leave and as a parent you recognize, well, that may be putting my kids more in harm's way because, especially if the person's violent, right? That's going to be putting them more in harm's way. And as a parent, you don't want to do that. So I can see oftentimes how people stay in relationships like that just because, not just the fear, but the fear compounded with, I don't want to put my kids in more harm's way, that something even worse could happen to them. Yeah, abuse has this really interesting, uh, interesting is not the right word, this really unfortunate kind of trickle-down effect in that it doesn't just necessarily affect the victim, but it does trickle down to kids more often than we realize. Even just talking about the escape process, right? Yeah. A lot of times, I actually worked in a domestic violence shelter for a couple of years. I worked with the children specifically in that shelter. And one thing that we noticed right away we would do kind of psychoeducational groups with them. We would do playtime activities with them. And we always brought them to the playroom in the shelter. And at the end of the night, we would notice that they would start taking like the sand from the sandbox. They would start taking the Barbie houses and they would be putting it in their clothes, in their shoes, in their sleeves to try and go upstairs. And that wasn't allowed. You weren't allowed to take toys from the playroom to go upstairs. Okay. Okay to realize it was happening because they didn't they didn't have any of their own things. They didn't have any of their own toys. Oh. 
lot of times you're having to leave that house with the clothes on your back and maybe one or two other sets of clothing. The kids aren't getting their favorite toy. They're not getting their favorite stuffy because they have to go that quickly and that suddenly. So we t- we ended up, end of that story is we did a toy drive and we were able to donate about 400 toys so that each kid got their own set of toys, which is awesome. But we do see a lot of problems with, you know, kids having poor emotion regulation coming out of that, not knowing how to express emotions, not knowing how to deal with stress. We know that intergenerational transmission of trauma and violence happens where a lot of times it's who grew up in abusive households, you know, unfortunately as adults, they are either victims or abusers themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is such a complex issue. It really is a public health issue. It mm-hmm. is not just a family issue. It's not just a family, uh, or I'm sorry, it's not just an issue between husbands and wives, which is how it's been portrayed for decades in our society. But this is a public health issue that has real, very real ramifications for us that we need to be addressing. Well, you gave me goosebumps because when you think of it, I'm very passionate. I, yeah, I mean, you gave me goosebumps because if you think of the impact that it has on kids just in that moment, if kids are not getting the help they need, like emotional, mental help that they need, how are they processing all that that's been going on? Not just the abuse itself, but the aftermath of that, right? Of the, the long-term aftermath of the abuse of leaving the situation, of living in, a split, for example, a shelter, not having their favorite things, you know, maybe living in fear or being in an environment where the parent they're with is living in fear, constantly on higher look, constantly looking over their shoulder. Like all those things may seem like just one, okay, well, you're, you're constantly looking over your shoulder. The kids pick up on all those things. And then they take that with them. So if they're in second grade, they take that with them in third grade. And then it, they start, it starts impacting those stories that they tell themselves, their belief in themselves, their confidence, all those things, how they build relationships, how they communicate, all those things. And then they take that with them as they become adults and because they've never processed any of those things. And then how do they function in society as a teenager? as an adult, within a relationship, in the workplace. So it starts trickling out into every other area of their life too. So it's so important to help them get the help and to process situations as they're going through it. So you, so less chance that they're going to have those long-term lingering effects. Yeah. And it's really interesting. This kind of ties into the work that I do within school and what I study as a researcher. I look a lot at stress and how stress can be passed down. A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, But when we look at our stress hormones, things like cortisol, the way that our body reacts to that and regulates that can be passed down to our children. And so we have this phenomenon called biological predisposition to stress. And so essentially what it means is if you had really stressed out parents, genetically you might be more predisposed to be reactive to stress. And so you- Wow, I didn't know that really interesting, isn't it? And so you might face more negative side effects of that. But one one reason I love this theory is because a lot of our talk today has sounded really, really sad and really upsetting and really very much like, oh, if you experience this abuse, then it's going to be tough for you and it's going to be tough for your kids. But what we see with biological predisposition is that those kids actually are really predisposed to benefit from interventions as well when we compare them to other children. So actually getting those kids support, making sure that they are getting support, that they're getting the help they need, that they're getting the lessons they need, we see that they end up benefiting quite a bit from that, which is so exciting. That is very exciting. And yeah, most of it may seem like it's sad, but it's also much needed to share with people out there going through those exact things, that there's support, that there's resources, that, you know, that they can be encouraged and empowered and inspired to go out there and create a different life for themselves, that there's information and people who want to help them to create that better life, that whatever that looks like in their life, whatever kind of abuse looks like in their life, that there's other ways of living. They don't have to continue to live that way. So 
it, it may sound out, but it's also very encouraging and a much needed topic for us to talk more about because if we're not talking about it, people aren't going to be aware of it. They're going to stay in the situation. And then what does that look like? So we want people to know that there's help out there, that there's support, there's resources in different ways that they can go about getting it, but also that they're not alone, that we want to help them and that there's a different way that they can live in a better life for themselves. I mean, just think of it, Arcadia, if you had not been through that at 14, unfortunately, you had to go through that to have this platform, to have this passion, to have this voice for so many other people who don't have a voice for themselves, that can't speak up for themselves. And unfortunately, you went through that, but something really amazing and something great is going to come out of it, just like all those people who might be dealing with something similar in their life. There's something great and powerful that's going to come out of it once you process it and get to the other side. And I think that's something really special that I have seen, especially recently as I've been kind of out doing work in this realm. I use the phrase survivor turned advocate a lot in my paperwork for Miss Massachusetts and Miss America. And a lot of what we see actually is a lot of these nonprofits that really work towards domestic violence were created by a survivor. Mm -hmm. And there's been such a, a community that builds up of women or men coming out of these situations getting the help they need, getting themselves back on their feet, and then realizing that they want to help others. And so again, if you're listening to this and you're kind of in that situation, uh -huh. there's so much love that is like ready to surround you because this is a community of people who have been through what you're going through and they're ready to help you out of it. Yeah. And they're there to support you because it takes a village to do something like this, especially when you're in situations like that. It's not something that you can do by yourself. Reach out. There's lots of people who want to help and lots of support. So tell us where people can reach out. And we're going to put all Arcadia's information and all these resources in the show notes as well, if you want to reach out to Arcadia, but also if you want to reach out to the resources. So if people are struggling with those things, just give us some, like real quick where they should go look to get that help. So whether it's creating that safety plan where they can find a template for that or, you know, housing or anything like that. What could they start to Google and find? Yeah. So my two personal favorites, I mentioned love is respect earlier, which is definitely focused more on a younger generation, more on teen dating violence. There's also the National Network to End Domestic Violence, which is a great organization. Really, if you, if you even just Google national resource, domestic violence, there's going to be a ton that pop up for you. Blingsting is the company that I mentioned earlier. They sell those personal safety devices. If you want to get a safety alarm or pepper spray or even just an emergency hammer to keep in your car, they have a lot of options for you. And then if you need to reach out to me, you can find me on Instagram at Miss Boston Org or through my own, which is Arcadia Yule. And then I'm sure you can include my website and all of that good stuff too. But Arcadia, you always that. Yes, I love it. We'll include all that in the show notes. Thank you so much, Arcadia, for being here and for sharing all that information. What's up next for you? Oh, goodness. This is a very busy time of year for me. I just finished the third year of my PhD. So this summer, I am launching dissertation research. And in about one month, I will be competing for the title of Miss Massachusetts. And Hopefully the opportunity to get to do this on a, a bigger scale over the next year compete for Miss America. Woo! Yes, we all be rooting and cheering you on. Go out there and break a leg. And I know it'll be an awesome dream come true for you. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. And if you're in a situation of abuse and you need help, please reach out. There's lots of people and support systems out there for you, even on a local level. So make sure that you find that help that you need. And also, if their children are involved, make sure that you get them the help they need so they can better process the situation and keep being their best, amazing self. And just know that we are here supporting you and encouraging you. And you can do whatever you set your mind to. We believe in you. You got this. And if you want to go out and compete for any pageants and you're interested in more information about that as well, because that's always a fascinating topic, you can reach out to Arcadia on that too. So we'll see you next time. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye. Are you ready to move to your next level of rockstar greatness? 
CFO, Chief Fund Officer, number one bestselling author, and keynote speaker, Blaze Rector, is ready to help you do that. At just 10 years old, he's already written two number one bestselling books. Through the power of storytelling, he uses lessons learned and shares strategies, tips, tactics, and tools to inspire, empower, and motivate you to live a more amazing life. So if you're ready to do that in your own life, grab a copy of his number one bestselling books at justcorrector.com forward slash store. And when you order your copies, he will personally autograph them and write you a message on those books before shipping them out to you to really inspire and empower you in your life. These books are great for adults and kids alike. So if you're ready to move to your next level of rock star greatness, make sure you grab your copy at justcorrector.com forward slash store. Enjoy those amazing, empowering, transformational books. Did you know that the two biggest issues impacting the workforce are mental health and burnout? Well, we have your solution. The more that you feel burned out, the more it impacts your mental health. The more your mental health is impacted, the more it leads to burnout. So it's a vicious cycle that goes around and around, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can help them both if you're intentional and strategic with it. We have lots of resources for you at justcorrector.com forward slash store. One that I want to highlight that really enhances your mental health is Tame Your Brain Game, 52 Tips to Turn Negative Thoughts into Positive Action. Now, research shows that 80% of your thoughts are negative. No matter how positive you feel, it's the pattern and the habit that you've developed over the course of years, over the course of decades. And that can often impact your life, how you show up, how you lead, how you communicate, how you engage, whether at work or at home. And then it also impacts a work environment. All you need is one NN or TT, negative Nancy or toxic Tim, to really impact that work environment. So if you are ready to enhance your mental health, get your copy of Tame Your Brain Game, 52 Tips to Turn Negative Thoughts into Positive Action today at justcorrector.com forward slash store. All books are autographed with a personal message just for you. Thank you so much for being here. Check us out at thesayyesexperience.com. Our mission at the Say Yes Experience is to empower 10 million people to say yes. With your help in sharing our podcast, we can do that. Follow us on all social media at the Say Yes Experience and join our free community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the Say Yes Experience. Thank you again to our guests. You can find all the contact information for our guests in the show notes. Thank you to our CFO, Chief Fund Officer, Blaze Rector, our business advisor, Lisa Verhurek, and to our team at Jessica Rector Enterprises. We look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Have an amazing day and keep being a rock star. Oh, 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 oh